1.21 gigawatts. Great Scott. Hey there, this is John Burns with John Burns Fine Art. Today I want to talk about my rotational casting machine, also known as a rotocaster. I will talk about the materials and methods I've employed to create my machine and uh, where I'm at on it. I also would like to mention that the items in the making of this project are going to be listed in the description down below. So I encourage you to look at the description. Uh, the links will take you over to Amazon. Also, uh, there's some other goodies in there, like my Instagram link if you want to follow me off YouTube and see what I'm doing on Instagram. That link is also down below. Uh, if you like this video, hit like and please subscribe for more fun videos like these and select all notifications so you can stay current as I release the videos. So that's that. Let's get going. Thanks for coming along, guys. Okay, guys, this is my rotational casting machine. This is where I'm at so far. I haven't been able to complete it, um, but I'll show you what I've got. Um, one of the things that you want to consider with a rotational casting machine is your smallest dimension here. The smallest dimension is going to dictate the largest mold that you can put in here. So, um, this is actually 13 and 3 quarters inside, so it's a smaller capacity, and this way is 15 and a quarter. So, I might be able to go a little bigger if it turns, say, this way, if it can clear like 16 and a half inches. Meaning, if I want to not necessarily put it in here, but if it's longer hanging out, it can hang out to a maximum of 16 and a half because it can clear the second box that way. But we're definitely limited within uh, 15 inches and the um, 16 and a half. Yep. So I've got this set up so it actually turns one time and here for every time that way. Uh, the way some of these work is uh, some people only get half of a turn here, like that, for the full turn. This gear here has to be static. This cannot move. Because this one is uh, forced to walk this gear, which does move. So I took a uh, half inch dowel rod here. And these, by the way, are just bike parts. This is a bike chain. I will warn you though, uh, one of the problems I ran into with this bike chain is that these teeth were too wide for the gears. I couldn't figure out what in the world was going on. I was thinking that these were just spaced too far apart and that's why it wasn't seating until I realized at one point that I had to file these teeth flatter. So I got a, a Dremel with the grinding wheel and I ground down each tooth a little thinner uh, so that it could sink into these bike chain teeth. And then of course you just uh, measure it to the length that you need. And if you don't have a chain breaker, they do have videos on how to break a chain without a chain breaker. You basically uh, take the a drilled hole on something and then put that pin over the drilled hole and you tap it out and then you'll have to finish from there. So um, anyway, so this rod is a half inch and I don't know if you can see this very well here. I filled the inside of the spike gear with a half inch piece of uh, birch ply. I uh, glued it down and then this half inch rod I hooked up to it and I, uh, I probably ran a screw and then also did the uh, JB weld there. So that's that's on there pretty well. Now on this side of the rod to make sure that it didn't slide in and out I just made my own cotter pin. I took a paneling nail and bent it you know a rainbow shape with a pin, drilled a hole and then pegged it through there and that's just enough to keep it from going through. Now these parts here these are called beveled gears. You can have 3D printers print them or you can find other devices which use them. If you have a, an old broken bread machine and feel like, you know, salvaging, you know, do that. Or you could get on Amazon, like I did, 
and buy replacement parts for your uh, KitchenAid mixer. So these have bevel gears and then what I did was this is square notched inside so I just kind of beat a round peg into a square hole and then uh, once I saw where it was rubbing of course since it's square there's long dimensions I drilled a hole and ran a small pin through it so that it couldn't rotate inside of there. So there is another hole drilled through this inside of this cavity with a pin running through it to keep it from turning. This here uh, is a, a long bolt. This sits well with just like a, a quarter inch threaded bolt. Uh, so this hole is completely hollow. I just took uh, more JB Weld, mixed up that putty. It's a, an epoxy putty. And then I put this bolt on it. Well, you have to make sure that this is flat and that's perfectly centered straight up. Because if you don't, you're going to get a wonky head uh, that as it turns, it's going to want to do this kind of elliptical up and weird thing. You want it to be perfectly concentric so that it turns with this. Otherwise, you're going to have it skipping and dodging when it needs to be uh, turning. So I drilled this bolt, I drilled through the thread and ran a, another paneling nail through there and uh, I have plenty of washers to space this to make sure that that's tight. Put a slight hook on it, put a screw there so that as this turns, you can see how as, as that turns, it eventually that screw stops it. Well it's the screw that's actually turning so it catches that screw and that's what turns that box. These holes that I drilled through here, I drilled it through with a 5 16 and then I took a regular like, you know, ballpoint pen like this and I, you know, emptied it out, I gutted the pen and then I cut it into the length that I needed here. Cut, cut, you know, cut, cut. And then I you can peg those into the wood, into that 5 16 hole, and then you have a quarter inch hole, and then that acts to help these not get hung up. It creates less friction, so you don't have the bolt tearing in on the wood. Uh, up here, it's kind of the same thing. I drilled a hole through the end of the uh, screw and ran a, I, I bent a pen, or a, a paneling nail, like a cotter pen and put that through there and of course the washer is there to help stop tearing it up. So I used, the equipment that I used was a wind drill press, drill press. I'll put that in the description. And I also used a wind scroll saw. Uh, so these are great items. They're relatively affordable compared to like uh, some of the other ones out there, I tell you. And these have been very reliable. So I got the scroll saw for like 117 and the drill press for like 140 or something like that. I can't remember, but it'll be in the description. You'll see the actual price. Um, so then as I come around over here, what I did was I measured this. This is like a two inch motor and I just swung a compass and cut that out with the scroll saw and I had uh, measured the distance for the front of this motor because there's little pins. I wasn't quite sure how to rig this up. So in here, there's two bolts that are attached to the motor, but you can see the screws on the back. I attached them to this board that way. And then once I had this motor hooked up to this quarter inch birch ply, I just glued that down to this and ran some nails to secure it and it's it's been holding fine. But then this has a 5 16th bolt and it's it has a hole running through it. So um, I set it up to where I could drill into this frame. Uh, I believe that that's an eighth inch there. And then I just took a piece of welding rod and I ran that in there and then bent it and stapled it. So this is actually going through the the motor's center axis here, the uh, bolt. I don't even need to use a, uh, a nut there to keep that on there because this welding rod is keeping it pinned 
on the inside of the frame. So this, when this powers it, it's going to force that bolt to turn. And as that turns, then I get the action all together. I mean, I could sit here and manually rotate this for 20 minutes. Some of these have a hand crank so that you can take it around like a hurdy-gurdy. And uh, that's that way. So with this circuit board, I took a, a Bic, one of those transparent Bic pins, and I cut off like three-eighths sections and then I just used uh, wood screws to mount this to the board. So that gives plenty of airflow behind the circuit board. Don't have to worry about it getting terribly hot. It keeps it off of there. And um, I went ahead and hooked this up to the power. There is a uh, fuse here that's a 10 amp. But I, at first, see I'm still pioneering this. I'm not an electrician. I'm an artist. And I had just run this straight with uh, just a cord, a lamp cord, straight from this to the power. Well, as soon as I hook that on, there's sparks fly. So, you know, be careful. Be very careful. I'm just telling you what I did, and I don't want you to do what I did. So if you do what I do, it's on you. Um, and so I ran direct current into this direct current motor. Don't do that. You need an AC, an alternate current converter. And uh, the way that I understand, anyway, let, before I get there, um, so I took an AC adapter and I hooked it up and this converts it as I plug it in. But this is not enough power. I don't know if this can even be seen here, but this says that it is a, um, the output is a seven and a half volt and a two amp. Well, this is a uh, DC 12 volt motor, and I think it's a 30 watt. So, if we do that, the way that I understand this, and if uh, any electricians watching this video want to comment, go ahead and leave it in the description. But I, the way that I understand this, on the AC converter, I have a seven and a half volt, and I'd multiply that by the amperage, two and a half amps, which would give me 15 watt. So I'm only getting half the power out of this motor that I should be getting. So what I'm honestly looking for, I want to get a 12 volt output with a two and a half amp. And that should get me to 30 watt. So, uh, 12 times two and a half. And that'll get me to the 30 watt. And that should power this well and get this hopefully to perform the way it was intended to. Because right now you can't tell the difference whether it's on the far left or far right setting how that's supposed to behave. So right now, and this if this uh, gets going too fast, the idea is to clamp this down to the tabletop. So let's see here, I don't wanna hit that. Yeah, so right now if I want to, I can put molds in here what I would do is if, you know, say like I had a smaller mold that I wanted to run through here, I would either take a, a piece of screen, uh, maybe something like chicken wire or, uh, you know, something like that, some type of mesh screen, or you, and then I would staple it, you know, in key places, and then you tie down your mold with uh, either cord or something like that, or you could just start off by running staples one two three four five six seven eight wherever you need them and then kind of run um, either bailing wire or something like that so that you have something to secure your mold to that's how you end up securing the mold inside of one of these is to have um, some type of brace so like what I wanted to do here with this one was run this bar here to here and again here to here and then that way I could put my molds on here and then just strap them to that and if I need to I could probably put one across here and then that should give me sufficient you know wiggle room to put any mold on this after I do that 
then I can, you know, manually turn this, and I can guarantee that I'm going to get a really nice even coat. You know, it's going to turn it. And the great thing about a homemade rotocaster is that if you ever push this thing to its limits, I mean, just too far, you you know how you built it. You can replace the parts. So. Um, like these paneling nails. If that ends up getting bent out of shape, preventing this from turning, I can just go get a tempered paneling nail. You know, that one's not tempered. But right now it's working, so I'm going to put faith in it. And as I just continue to turn this, I know that I'm getting a good round and round covering. And this is really good with resin molds. And this isn't terribly exhausting. You know, you can put on whatever you want to bench in the background and just stand here and do this while you watch your program or, you know, whatever you want to do. Have a conversation with somebody who's sitting there drinking coffee watching you. I'm just kidding. So this is it. This is my rotational casting machine. Um, the wood was just scrap wood that I put together. You know, I recommend running two nails in each board just to keep it from turning, uh, you know, sideways, flipping weird. And I have a carry handle on it. I tried to set it up because I figured this side would be heavier, uh, but it might end up being heavier on that side. But I can carry this and set it, you know, I can slide this in a nice thin spot, but when you operate it, you obviously need a lot more room. see so the my philosophy in my studio is because it's not as my studio space isn't as big as I want it to be is that everything has to be able to be put away put somewhere um, you know I guess that's kind of a uh, IKEA philosophy things uh, have a place they can be broken down and folded and stowed until they need to be used so uh, you guys chime in you, if I could improve this let me know um, if uh, it encouraged you, let me know. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming along. Thanks for letting me share this with you. I appreciate that. It means a lot. This stuff is not that much fun to do if I can't share it with somebody. You know? All right. Take care, guys.